reading is from Romans 8, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've got a, a visiting speaker today. We've got Mark Lawrence. <laughs> Only one woo. So, Mark, come to, uh, uh, come, come to the front, and let's pray uh, for Mark as he comes to speak to us. Father God, thank you for Mark. Uh, he gives his life and his time to us in so many ways. And uh, I know that for him, there's also uh, a calling and a gift in opening up Scripture and, and sharing that and teaching that. So I pray you bless him in his gift this morning. Thank you for what you've already given to him through this passage for himself. And I pray, God, that you'd use the words that you've given him and the thoughts you've given him to help us in our journey with you and our life in the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for ever wooed me. I appreciate one. Sorry, you got me singing and speaking this morning. Um, so we're looking at Romans 8 this morning, start of Romans 8, and uh, all of you remember last week we looked at Romans 7, and I think the week before we looked at Romans 6, so um, yeah, logically next week we'll be looking at Romans, no, the second half of Romans 8, come on. So, who here would describe themselves as a glass half full person? Jenny, Liz, Rich, three positive people in the church, Tim. Yeah, who would, there you are, Alan, come on, you are Alan, come on, surely. It would describe themselves as a glass half empty person. <laughs> Who has no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> ah. Who has a complex answer to the simple question? <laughs> Some people have an amazing ability to remain positive, to see the good in all situations, and remain upbeat, while others, and I'm very much included in, in this, have a more, I like to think, realistic cautious, some would say negative, outlook uh, on things, on life. Um, over, the, over the years, uh, I've kind of read Paul's letters, uh, and I've seen this tension at work between this present-day reality that life is at times a struggle, to this wonderful and glorious hope that one day we have a beautiful future. Uh, and, and nowhere is this sort of tension between positive and, and maybe slightly real uh, seen greater than the letter uh, of Romans. So we finished Romans 6 and 7 with Paul talking about the struggle with sin. How he wants to do right and he wants to do good, but how evil and sin are always there, ready to trip him up. And yet right at the start of Romans 8, we have the most encouraging, exciting, life-defining piece of good news uh, in the whole of the Bible, I would suggest. And Rich kind of did my preach for me just now by, by kind of saying it, but, but it says those who are in Christ Jesus, 
have no condemnation. Those who are in Christ Jesus have no condemnation. Or in other words, those who are in Christ Jesus are not found guilty, do not receive punishment. Now turn to the person next to you and tell them very quickly what was the last piece of good news that you received and how did that make you feel? Ready? Go. No matter how we view life, uh, no matter how much... um, Sometimes we struggle in life or how much we might find a joy in life. There is something about receiving good news, isn't there? Something about receiving good news that lifts us up, that picks us up, that excites us, that gives us hope. And this is what Paul is doing here. He is delivering the best news possible for us, us who follow Jesus. He is delivering the news that we are saved, that we are free, and that we are no longer condemned. We are saved, we are free, we are no longer condemned. Just let that sink in for a minute. We are saved, we are free, we are no longer condemned. If you take nothing else from this morning and the ramblings that I come out with and the ramblings that Richard comes out with, then hold on to this truth because it is a truth that is real for all who are in Christ. That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 7 Um, which we looked at last week, I said, is is not the end of the story. And that is another piece of good news because Paul starts Romans uh, 8, verse 1 here with with a word, a word, uh, therefore. The word therefore is an odd word maybe to start uh, a new chapter with unless it refers to something that has happened before or something that might be coming up next. You see, in chapter 6 and 7, Paul has outlined how sin is a very present reality not only in the sense of a day-to-day struggle with stuff that we all deal with, that we all struggle with, but also that sin exists in the world. And it has existed in the world since uh, the fall of Adam and Eve, the creation story, and will continue to exist until the day Jesus returns. Because sin exists in the world, there will always be a pull on us by things of the flesh, as Paul describes it. And we should look at what that means in a little bit. Unfortunately, this is the reality of the world that we live in, where many, many people choose to live outside of God's best, choose to ignore God's will and his purposes, and where people choose to make other things the king of their lives, as opposed to Jesus. The word, therefore, at the start of Romans 8, indicates that Paul is heading into a conclusion of the last few chapters of Romans on sin. And that conclusion is this amazing piece of good news. That yes, the reality of sin in the world is still there. But for those of us who are in Christ, we have an absolute assurance and guarantee that the old sinful nature is dealt with, even if at times we still blow it and mess up. We also have a promise that Jesus, through his spirit, will lead us uh, in our present reality, our day-to-day lives. And we have a guarantee of a future eternity spent in the presence of our maker. That excites me. Anyone else excited by that promise? Good, three of you, excellent. (laughs) Hey, you're a blessing this morning. Sin is dealt with. That is huge, that is massive. That is something that I personally have struggled to deal with in my own life. I struggle and I still do with with a sense of uh, being forgiven, with a sense of shame, with a sense of reflecting on past mistakes. And yet Paul teaches us here in this passage that sin in all its forms is dealt with. Sin is dealt with. Verse 3 says that Jesus was sent to be a sin offering. His death, death even, and his resurrection has condemned sin and has not condemned us. So what does it mean for sin to be condemned? Well, it means it has had its power taken away from it. Sin has been punished. Sin has no power. Well, that is, again, that's, that's a huge thing, isn't it? Sin has no power. Death has lost its sting, as the old hymn proclaims. So what does this mean in reality? Because if you're anything like me, then every day is still a struggle, it's still a battle. We all struggle with things, whether it's jealousy or anger or or gossip or lying or, or gambling or greed, whatever it might be, the list goes on and on and on. Paul himself has just spent two chapters of Romans talking about his struggle with sin. And yet here in verse three, we find that sin has been condemned. My understanding of this and this is my understanding, so don't quote me on this, unless you think I'm right, 
uh, is that we live, we live in a fallen world. Adam and Eve, the, the creation account, if you don't know what I'm talking about, read the start of Genesis. Sin entered the world, and therefore no one is exempt from kind of seeing or feeling the effects and the pressures of this, of sin. However, through Jesus, God set in motion a way for all of us to be free from the effects and burdens and power of sin. The enemy, Satan, the evil one, sin, whatever you want to call it, has been defeated. And as Paul goes on to say later, we who are in Christ can stand firm in this truth that sin has been defeated. So sin only has power when we give it power. Okay? Sin only has power when we give it power. The enemy can't touch God because God has already won. God has already defeated sin and, and the enemy through the cross, through the resurrection. And so the only way that, that the enemy can get at God is through causing us, mankind, womankind, children, his created beings, to stumble. He does this by accusing us, by sowing seeds of doubt, uh, by tempting us to do things that are not of God, uh, by, by making them seem more attractive, by, by dangling the things of the flesh, as Paul says it, in front of us. This is why the enemy is often called the accuser of man, because the only power he has over us uh, and over God is, is us, is by accusing us, is by getting at us. And this is what Paul is saying in the previous chapters. I mean, we, you know, we heard last week uh, about this, but, but Paul is saying that there is a tension, um, and the tension is caused uh, because sin is in the world already. Sin exists and the only way, though, that sin has power uh, against the creator of the universe is when we give it power. That is attention. So if, if lying or greed or gambling or anger or self-harm or self-doubt or, or gossip or any sin that is listed in the Bible, and, and sin, by the way, is basically uh, just anything that goes against God's best for us or, or God's way of doing things, sin only has the power that we let it have over us. So... The question must be then, how do we not let it have power over us? How do we not give sin a foothold in our lives? Well, Paul says in, in verses five to six that those who live according to the sinful nature, in some translations this is called the flesh, have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. Now when the Bible talks about flesh, and it talks about it quite a lot, or about the sinful nature, it is always a negative thing. It basically refers to the wrong use or the corruption or the decaying of the created order and the physical world, be that our bodies or nature or the environment. A lot of people translate the flesh as being about kind of sexual sin, uh, um, but actually it's not just about physical desires. The flesh refers to um, the wrong use of ourselves, so the wrong use of our, our actions or our words or our thoughts or our bodies and the corruption of the world around. However, when the Bible talks about the spirit, it refers to God's own spirit, the Holy Spirit, that inner tangible sense of God in our lives. And this, the Holy Spirit, is always good because the Spirit brings life. And life is a good thing. So how do we not give sin the power it craves? Well, we do so by setting our minds on the Spirit, by focusing our minds on Jesus, by becoming in Christ. Now, we've mentioned this term quite a lot, and I know Richard did a great analogy last week uh, about what it means to be in Christ. But, but basically, it, it is Paul's way of describing a new order, uh, a new uh, regime, uh, a new way of being and living and thinking and breathing in which men, women, and children take on when they give their lives to Jesus. Being in Christ is a union between us and God. It means we've pledged a new allegiance and committed to a new way of thinking. To be in Christ also means to be a member of the church. Sorry about that, but that's what it means. Paul describes it as being a limb or an organ of Christ's body. So if we are in Christ, we're not only joined to Jesus, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, we're also joined to his community and to his family. 
It is not an individual thing being in Christ, but rather it is a shared together thing. We are never alone when we are in Christ. Even when temptation comes, uh, or suffering rears its ugly head, or trouble or hardship come a knocking, we are never alone. We have each other, and we have the promise of life through the Spirit, and all that life through the Spirit brings peace, goodness, hope, transformative love, protection. The list goes on and on and on. These are things that we have the promise of in Christ. Verse 9 says that those of us who are in Christ, uh, uh, and by the way, the offer to be in Christ isn't quite, it's not like an exclusive club. You don't have to be a certain size or shape or have a great beard like me or, 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 you know, or age or, or sex or whatever. You don't, there's no kind of uh, rules and, and regulations about who can be in Christ. It is open to every single one of us in this room, in this community, in this city, in this country, in this world. Those of us who are in Christ are not controlled by the flesh, by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. This is yet more good news because Paul is saying we don't need to be controlled by the things that the world throws at us, the things that we are tempted with. Because when we give our lives to Jesus, when we become in Christ, we're naturally filled up, filled up this way, with the Spirit. The Spirit is always there. And maybe sometimes we don't sense it or feel it, uh, but all we ever have to do is just kind of come back to the cross, come back to Jesus, refocus our minds, refocus ourselves uh, upon Jesus. And we get to live in the Spirit. We get to be filled with the Spirit. Now, you may be thinking, uh, sat there thinking, what, what the flip is he on about? <laughs> How can I do that? How can I focus on, on the Spirit? How do I train my mind onto the things of Jesus and God rather than on the things of the world, rather than on, on money or, or power or, or whatever it might be? Of course, you might also be sat there thinking, what do I want for lunch and who's going to win a World Cup tonight? But fix your minds on things of the Spirit, not on things of the world. Germany, by the way. <laughs> Maybe Argentina, I don't know. Um, well, let me let you into a, a little secret. This thing is the easiest thing in the world to do. This new thinking, this having a mind that's focused on things of the Spirit, well, it, it's actually quite simple. You see, Paul tells us that in choosing to follow Jesus, in becoming a Christian, one who is in Christ, we are being saved from something, saved from a life of darkness, a life which, although it may not feel bad in worldly terms, will ultimately lead to separation from God for eternity. And we're saved from this thing into a life uh, where we are made new, where we walk in the light of his love, his grace, his protection. A life which may involve pain, which may involve struggle in worldly terms, but that will ultimately, ultimately lead to an eternity spent in the presence of our loving God, free from the troubles of this world. This is the beautiful hope that we inherit when we transfer our allegiance from, uh, from the things of the world to God, when we become in Christ. We are transferred from this life that leads to death to a journey of hope that leads to to life. And this is life through the Spirit. Now, I've spoken about this before, but there are two uh, Greek words, uh, uh, Greek being the uh, language that the New Testament was, was written in or translated in, uh, which mean new. So, two words that mean new. Uh, the first is kainos, uh, which meant to be new in relation to being fresh something that's recreated into something better. Think about when you decorate your house. You, if you're decorating a room, you don't kind of knock the whole house down and rebuild it, do you? You just kind of take the wallpaper off, you paint it, you, you, know, uh, you, you, know, you might take the whole house down. I'm just looking at my brother there. Yeah. But um, for most people, we don't. We, we recreate what's already there into something fresh and new. Now, neos, the other words, say neos. Say it again. Neos, thank you. That's a bit of Greek you can take to work tomorrow morning. Uh, neos basically means to become young again, to start your time over again. Neos, new, means brand new. Kainos is about an improved version of the old self, whereas neos is about restarting from scratch. Now, in, in a later letter, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he says that when we choose, when we choose to follow Christ, we leave the old behind. This is what baptism is about. We leave the old behind and we become in Christ, and our minds are made new, 
Now the word he's using, this word new, is the word neos, new. So in other words, when we uh, give our lives to Jesus, when we're baptised, uh, we, we, we start again from scratch. We restart the journey of life. We get a completely new way of thinking about life and the people and the circumstances that we come across in that life. If we think differently, we act differently. It just follows naturally. When we enter into this new life in Christ, we get given a new way of thinking, and it's completely free. So therefore, I told you it's simple. Just become a Christian, all we have to do. It's a bit harder than that. But anyway, in essence, that's what happens. And the consequence of this is that we, uh, uh, you know, we begin to think differently to the way we thought before. And as I've just said, when we think differently, we start to live differently. It's natural. We can't stop it. We receive the Holy Spirit and we receive the assurance that not only is there no condemnation, but also our minds have been set free and transformed. We can therefore choose to fix our minds on things of the world, but, but why would we? We can actually have the, the option to choose and fix our minds on the things of God instead. And we can be secure, therefore, that we are not alone no matter what. I hope this makes sense. New mind, new way of thinking, new way of living. So, practically, in reality, what does this mean? What do the amazing truths in this passage mean for us? And I want to encourage you to go away and read Romans 8, the whole of it, um, anyway, because it's a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, book, uh, chapter full of so many truths um, that if we can believe and get hold of, it will change the way we think and, and, and live. What do the amazing truths in this passage mean for us in this building today with our lives so full of ups and downs? Do we just kind of sit back and do we wait for Jesus to come, feet on the sofa, maybe not on the sofa, feet on the little thing that you put your feet on, stool, that's it. Uh, can we just rest up and carry on living how we want to because we know we are secure in our salvation? Or is there some kind of implication for our lives now? Implications of how we speak, act and think. Well, on the one hand, we do have this amazing assurance of forgiveness when we stumble, of guidance when we are lost, and of peace when things get rocky. But being in Christ is not just, and I emphasize the word just, is not just a free ticket to heaven, but rather is a blueprint for life right now. I'll say that again. Being in Christ is not just a free ticket to heaven, but rather it is a blueprint for life right now. You see, Paul says in verse 11 that the Spirit breathes life into us. If something has life in it, it, it is doing something. It is alive, it is living, it's breathing, it's at work, it's at play. It's doing something, it's alive, it's vibrant. When we undergo a regime change and are subsequently in Christ, when we enter this new life, which is spirit-breathed, and where, as we've already seen, we gain a brand new mind, which influences the way we think about what we do, and the characteristics, gifts that make up this life, something's different, something has changed, we are changed. We live, we breathe, we, we, we work, we play, but we do these things differently with a mind that is set on the spirit. You see, the thing that I've come to learn over the years is that living in Christ is simply about that, living. Living doesn't just mean going to church, you'll be pleased to hear. Once a week, twice a week if you're really keen, three times a week if you're super keen. But it means, well, living, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, you get the picture. We are different people now. We are under a different regime. We have been transformed with a new mind and a fresh version of ourselves. And this means that the things that we once thought and we once did that did not honour God are now to be left behind as we pursue this journey of becoming more like Jesus. A new mind, one that is fixed on the things of God, on the things of the Spirit, will naturally lead us to a new way of living, doing, and being. Did you get that? Good. Instead of living by the sinful nature, by the flesh, where we engage in sin, be it, well, I don't need to list a bunch of sins to you. And the thing to say here is that, that sometimes we think there's this great big sin up here and there's these little sins down here and that doesn't really matter. But, but sin is sin in God's eyes. It doesn't matter. You know, there's no difference between being, being greedy and, and killing someone, you know, sin is sin. It, it's, it's not God's best. It's not how he wants us to live. So instead of living in this way, in a life 
um, characterized by these things, by the things of the world, we are told to live by the Spirit, where our life is characterized by something else, by Jesus and the way that Jesus lived, by the fruits of the Spirit, by love, by patience, by kindness, by generosity, by encouragement, by community, by honesty, by peacekeeping, by selflessness. This is life through the Spirit. He wants to be treated like that. I do. And, and, and therefore, we want to be treated like that. Surely that's the way we, we treat. And this is a life that we have been freed to live and experience, no matter who we are or where we've come from. Because as Paul says in verse 2, Jesus has set us free from the stranglehold of death. Jesus has set us free from the stranglehold of death. The good news, and yes, there is more, is that we are not called to a life of perfection. Amen. <laughs> because we will never attain that, however hard we try. In fact, we'll probably only be setting ourselves up to fail. But we are called to live by the Spirit, to think on the things of God, to dwell on him who has given us life. And this, this dwelling on, on, on the Spirit could be as simple as maybe reading the Bible about every day, praying, sharing stories with people in church, uh, worshipping together, uh, connecting with God through creation. Things that take your mind off uh, yourself and fix your mind on the things of God. Because when we do that, we will be daily transformed. And then how we live our lives today, at the end of the service, this week, next year, for eternity, will be shaped by the things of God. As I kind of draw my ramblings to a conclusion, please hear these words again, that you are not condemned when you are in Jesus. This is a beautiful promise of good news. And this, in turn, should and will shape how we live our lives in the here and the now. Let's live in Christ and invite others into this life-giving journey. Let the fruit of our lives be the fruit of the Spirit. Now we're about to take communion in a minute and we're going to share in the bread and the wine and the similar, uh, symbolicness of, is that a word? I don't know, of death and resurrection of Jesus, recognising that we are alive in him. And as we take communion, I want to encourage you to dwell and think on two things. Firstly, dwell on the beautiful promise we've just heard that we, that you, each, every one of us in this room are not condemned, but are forgiven, free and whole in Jesus, no matter who we are or what we've done. And the second thing to dwell on, that if there's anything in our lives that perhaps we are struggling with that is not of the Spirit, it could be self-doubt, could be fear, uh, greed, anger, what we say or how we use our bodies, anything that is a struggle and not of God, then bring that before God in communion and lift up our eyes to Jesus. Uh, be free, be free and, and, and give this thing that we struggle with to the God who has set us free and who has promised us no condemnation, only freedom. Before we do this, before we go into communion and we dwell on these two things, uh, I just want to read, reread the, the passage, um, if you want, but I'm going to read a slightly different version, I'm going to read the message version. And maybe as I read it, maybe you just want to close your eyes and listen to these words. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. You see, the law always ended up being used as a band-aid, on sin, instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. But those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self is a dead end, but attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. 
anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking about themselves rather than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself, like this, has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life with his spirit living in you. Your body will be as alive as Christ's. It's a beautiful promise there. Uh, and we're going to take communion now, and I encourage you to dwell on, on, on those promises. But also, uh, if there's something about being filled with God's spirit that, that really strikes you this morning, maybe you haven't been, or maybe you have a long time ago and, and, and kind of feel a bit dry today, I encourage you to, again to use uh, kind of communion as a time to, to, to be filled again and get some prayer around those issues. Rich.